All right, so how we got here. So here are the two, so over the, this is something that I developed over the course of, uh, literally it's been the last five years. So first off, anybody have a relative who does not own a computer? I have a couple. And um, I have a couple that have never owned a computer and I think they never will. And one of them in particular asks a lot of questions like, you know, one of them is, he's a retired insurance executive and I think he's kind of a product of the Mad Men era a long time ago. And, and he reads the kind of the security news headlines and, and reads about things like data breaches and security disasters. And he, and he says things to me like, why do you let this happen? You know, why do you run your business this way? And so for a long time, I really couldn't figure out how to explain to him why these things happen and how we got to this place. Um, eventually I did and I'll show you, and, and that's kind of how I went down this road and I'll show you how that evolved. Um, secondly, I was at a dinner, this all started, I was at a dinner in Austin about five years ago with a bunch of security researchers and there were some very important people there from DHS, and one of them in particular was a very important person who wanted to start regulating software security and wanted to start immediately. And we were trying to, he was asking us, why can't I just do this tomorrow using product X? And I'll just say, you need to pass a scan by product X, and that's what you have to do. And we're trying to explain to him why he can't do that. And then that's actually uh, an interesting conversation. So as far as the problem statement, so we know that, um, I'm, by the way, I'm going to apologize in advance for my art skills. I did not have the support of a marketing department in producing that. So this, this is pure research. Um, so the good news is this is pure research with no marketing agenda whatsoever, but the bad news is my art skills. So um, obviously, you know, we, we, all we have to do is look at the headlines to see that there are security problems and security disasters across the landscape of growing size and intensity. As you can see, security disasters are actually getting larger as the years go by and more dramatic. And if we look at, um, this, is, this is a little bit hard to read, I apologize, because this is a photo and I don't have the original yet, but what this is showing us is that um, Vericode have been studying software security metrics for a long time using really, really large data sets. And what they're finding is that a lot of the metrics are not going in the right direction. Some of them are treading water and some of them are not getting better in terms of software security quality. And this, for example, what this is showing us is that it turns out that most applications actually fail their first OWASP top 10 assessment in terms of do you pass or fail? Do you have, you know, have you successfully avoided implementing the top 10 classes of security bugs as defined by OWASP? Most applications fail at that their first time. Um, it's not so much fail. Fail might be the wrong word. It's probably more a case of they just haven't actually tried to think about doing that yet. Um, this is just a, another kind of random data point. This is a chart of SQL injection vulnerabilities found in, in PHP questions and Stack Overflow. And this is, a, this is going back over roughly the, the last decade or so. And so um, over the course of the last five years as I've developing these talks, we've had lots of dramatic exchanges on Twitter where people like you know, the Cisco CEO Lots of people like the Cisco CR are saying every company will be broken into, everything will be broken into eventually, everybody's going to have a security problem. Um, then we have, you know, the, the latest trend in financial services now is, is there are security teams now that have unlimited budgets, which apparently is a thing in some companies. Um, they don't have a budget, they just get what they need. Um, Vericode um, gives a lot of really data-rich talks, and one of, the th one of the points that they make is that, th th one of the trends they're observing is that Security is getting so difficult that the, the tenure for a chief information security officer is actually contracting. And that the average tenure for a CISO is down to about 18 months now, just because they have more problems and solutions. All right, so why do we have soft, so um, going back to my, my older relative who's never owned a computer and doesn't understand any of what he sees in the news. Why, when somebody like this asks, why do we, you know, why do we let this happen? Why do we have, why don't we fix software security and just stop, just make it stop? You know, this is a little bit like trying to explain colors to a blind person. It's a really hard problem. So in order to do that, so in order to dig into this, first I want to dispense with some of the conventional wisdom, um, which I consider mythology. So this, um, these four things are really popular conventional wisdom that I've encountered over the course of being a security lead and a chief security architect a number of times, um, this, working in, in software manufacturers, large and small, working in both software manufacturers and, and software producing organizations that created software for internal use but didn't sell. Um, this is not a talk about a particular software manufacturer. This is about all software manufacturers. These economic forces apply to the entire marketplace, 
not to one company or another. So I don't want anybody to try to infer that this is, hey, this is about inside, you know, Acme, you know, this isn't about inside, you know, NCOM and software security fail at company X. This is about the marketplace. So let's, let's dispense with this very quickly first. So these are the four major myths, and I want to just go through them one at a time. So first one is it's a network security problem. Right? So we need to go to Black Hat and buy all the boxes that we see, you know, Black Hat, RSA, and just buy everything in sight, and then we will have security. And this is a myth that we've been chasing for a long time. Problem is, software security and application security and software engineering is not a network security problem. It's a, it's a code security quality problem. So I think we can pretty much agree on that. Um, next, sometimes what you see people do is they go in this pro they go in the, this um, direction of well, it's a it's a it's a process or a methodology problem, or it's you know well we need a process, and then the next thing is well we need a project manager or a, or a program manager or something like this to kind of manage the problem and you know report on metrics and kind of measure the badness and try to tell everybody what to do. Um, I mean this is you know measuring things is good. But a project manager alone, like throwing a project manager to at the problem and writing reports is not going to change the quality levels of your software. Next, it's a business problem, right? So this is another popular mythology. It used to be more popular than it is now, where you have people walking around saying, well, you need, you know, executive buy-in. You know, you need CEO buy-in in order to solve security. Um, this, I think, is mostly a myth because you know this never happens right this is not our problem right no ceo will ever take this position because he can't or she can't it's not reasonable right but again the ceo the ceo the cxo whether it's ceo cto cro etc cetera, etc cetera, they're not the bottleneck the bottleneck is elsewhere you know because CXOs do not decide what engineering teams are going to work on this week, this month, this year. They're just, they're, they're floating many levels above that. So they're, the bottleneck is elsewhere. So let's talk about the organization. So software manufacturers are organized um, differently, but there's a, there are common organizational patterns in most software manufacturers. So typically we have squads of developers and with a team lead or so you, know, you have junior developers, senior developers, and you have things like principal developers, and you'll have somebody like uh, a chief architect or a lead architect or a lead developer. You know, basically you have, you have teams of developers and you have unit leaders of some kind, whatever we call them. And, right, and this is not how they decide what to do. Right? This is not how software gets built. So this is why the CEO is not the bottleneck. By the way, these are, I'm using personas here from Dr. Strangelove because uh, there, are, there are a lot of personas in this talk as we talk about stakeholders and, and, and figures in the software manufacturing organization. So I'm actually using strange love characters as personas just to help us keep them straight, also to make it more, more fun and entertaining, right? All right, so next, it's an engineering problem. So how many times have we seen security teams like to, you know, security teams for some reason love to hate on developers and say, well, we need to train the developers, we need to yell at the developers, we need to run, you know, scan reports and drop 800 page scan reports, you know, raw results on them every hour or every day. And we'll do that until they surrender and they agree to do what we want, right? This is not useful. Now, why? Well, where this leads is, um, this actually leads to a really bad place because then what you have is, you have, in many organizations, you have security saying, well, we need to train the developers. And then, um, you know, but the problem is security doesn't always have a elaborate budget for this kind of training. So security will, guide, uh, security will often go and buy, you know, security or compliance will often buy these kind of boxed training products that are very rudimentary and very generic. And, and then you have this. And this, this is wrong. Right? This, this has to stop. This never happens in my organizations. I make sure that it doesn't. And this is something that, you know, it isn't productive, it isn't useful, but it, it also, it's, it's kind of inane. Why? Because developers are not the, developers also are not the problem. They're not where the bottleneck is. Because, why? Because if you think about, you know, this, the reason that this is, is inane is because most developers are actually highly educated. And some of them are actually very intelligent and very experienced and very good at what they do. At least many of them are. 
um, most most of my developers, if I ask them to solve, you know, an XSS or a SQL I or a remote command injection or any number of a hundred other things, if I ask them to solve it, they'll solve it, and and they don't need to go back to school to do that. Because they're good at their developers are good at figuring out how to build what you want them to build because that's what they do. So you know, training is not you know simple generic training classes in, in PowerPoints and you know computer animated training things are not the answer. Now there are exceptions. There are things like crypto and key management that get very complex and do require specialized knowledge and even external audits. And you you may need to go and get somebody like a Don Davis from MIT or somebody to help you figure that stuff out. Right, but fixing a, an XSS doesn't require going back to school any more than any any number of other things developers do, right? So back to organizations. So the way that software manufacturers organize is we have we have squads or teams of developers with some kind of a unit leader, and then we have the management organization. So in here, I'm going to use this laser pointer because it's really cool. So. The squads of developers. Let me just make sure I hear you can hear you. So, is this on? Good. So the squads of developers typically roll up into an engineering leader. Could be a director of engineering or VP of engineering or you know hierarchy, and the engineering leader typically rolls up into an EVP, an SVP, or some very important VP who typically rolls up into the C level, and then there's this another organization. There's a whole another organizational branch in the tree called product management when there may be a, and there may be many of these there may be product managers there may be product line managers product managers directors of product management senior directors of product management eventually there's a VP of product management there might be an EVP of product management and they roll up into an extra special VP that has an E or an S in front of his name and they all roll up into the CEO who is really floating above the details here and then you have this kind of weird security guy off in the corner that nobody really understands typically, and that's, that's me. So what is this all about then? So this is, I, threw, I put this in here because I actually started working on this talk five years ago, as I said. It's been, develop, it's been developing it for a long time, working with some advisors, and this was, um, this, this was a, something that was circulating at the time, so I had to throw it in. Um, this, this, by the way, this, this character here is actually Dr. Strangelove, for those of you that haven't seen the film. All right, so let's agree to dispense with this, method this mythology. And what I'm going to argue here today is that it's actually an economic problem. And it's an economic problem called a social dilemma, which is a game theory concept. So if we apply game theory, so what happened is after, um, le well, let me not get ahead of myself. So um, anybody who's seen the film might remember this. This is one of the, I, w I don't want to throw out spoilers here, but this is one of the points where the movie gets really silly at the end, and he start, they start talking, you'll have to see the film to understand this. Um, but the reason it's in here is, let's talk about, so this is, by the way, anybody ever read an SEC filing like a 10Q? Where if you're a public company, you have to do an SEC filing once a quarter, once a year. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but I only, I noticed this myself. You, when you do an SEC filing, you're required to do this disclosure about mine safety disclosures. Um, if you're a software manufacturer, you're required to, 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 you know, to state whether or not you have had mine safety disclosures. Everybody's required to do this. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm still trying to figure out exactly why, but I'm pretty sure the reason is because the history of this is that the the mining industry had a social dilemma in the earlier, if we go back to the earlier history of capitalism, many industries had social dilemmas around safety and the mining industry was one of the first and the worst examples. And so here's the NPR anecdote. So driving to New Hampshire to see my older relatives and trying to answer their questions, one day I found myself listening to NPR because there's not much else on the radio in, in New Hampshire where they live. And I mean, I love NPR, it's not a dig against them. But so they were doing a story about the early mining industry. So if we go back uh, almost two centuries, there was an enormous, one of, the, one of the largest, highest growth industries in the growth of the nation was mining, where an enormous fortunes were made in very short periods of time. And you know, mining was, you know, was, was as big and as important then, probably as, as software and big data and internet things are today. Mining was the thing of its day for a time. So, What's interesting is that when they, um, they decided that there was no business case for safety, 
because to the primitive business science of the day, the early capitalists said, well, my customers don't buy safety features, they buy precious metals. Therefore, there's no business case for safety, so I don't care about safety. So, because I only make things that I can sell. So, we will not spend time and effort or money on safety features. Why? Because, you know, my state-of-the-art business science tells me not to. So, what happened is the miners, if the miners wanted to have safety features, they had to do it themselves on their break time. So, if you wanted to build an air shaft or a tunnel support, you could do it on your lunch break, but nobody's getting paid for this. And, you know, if you did this while you're on the clock, you'd be fired. So, um, so, of course, you know, miners would rig improvised safety features as best they could, which, of course, were horribly inadequate, and there were terrible accidents and loss of life. And then we got into this very um, almost, almost Hobbesian state of affairs where the mining foreman would engage in a sort of a grim calculus of, well, how much loss of life is acceptable in order to reach my growth numbers and, and hit my KPIs. And, and this was considered acceptable in the, the earlier ages of capitalism, at least for a time. So eventually things got so bad that miners, riot, miners would strike and then they, the mining barons would bring in these private armies of people called Pinkerton guards to break the strikes and then the miners would riot and there would be conflict and loss of life and, and it, was, it was very violent and, and just, you know, it, was, it was incredibly uh, tragic at times and then it eventually got so bad that the government had to step in to restore order just to get things under control. And so, and this went on, you know, you can read the history of this, it went on for quite a while. So eventually, of course, today, you know, today we don't operate mines like this, because today we've learned that safe mines are actually more profitable at a higher cost basis, but they're more profitable because the mines are more productive when the miners don't die, right? But it took a long time for capitalism to learn that, and the same is true in other industries. So. This is our product, our project manager. Um, we're going to talk about the product manager in the role of software manufacturers. So, um, anybody know who this character is, by the way? This is another character from Dr. Strangelove. This is actually uh, General Buck Turgeson, who is the, the senior military leader in the room. So, uh, the product manager, we're going to look at some, uh, the product manager's view of the world. And I want to do this not because I don't want us to hate on the product manager, just like developers. I want us to empathize with the product manager, put ourselves in his shoes, and learn to see the world from his point of view, because that's what we have to do in order to solve this problem. So the product manager is, like the mining baron, is a pure capitalist. He looks at, he wants to build things and prioritize things according to revenue attached. He wants to build that which he can sell, because he wants to make his KPIs grow revenue, valuation, stock price, etc. So it's the product manager is where our bottleneck lies because the product manager in many ways outranks the VP of engineering or the engineering leadership because the product manager is the one who decides what we're going to build. And he decides that according to revenue attached, sales in progress, deals on the table, et cetera, and according to you know, features and deals that have the most revenue attached in the sales pipeline. And this is not wrong, this is capitalism. This is business. So, um, this is, so how do the product managers see us? So this is an actual, this is something I've heard more than one product manager and sales leader say. And, and, in, and in a way they're right because, again, this is not a dig. This is more or less fair because as security teams, as software buyers, um, as you know, security teams tasked with managing risk in the supply chain and reviewing software purchases, we typically don't have the budget and the ability to say, yeah, we will you know, we'll pay 2% more if you'll tack on these security features. We typically, security teams typically have the ability to say, no, that's unacceptable risk, but they don't typically have the ability to say, yes, we need this feature, and by the way, we'll, we'll kick in a little bit of extra revenue for it. Um, this is another quote. So, um, when prioritizing, so from a security, from a product manager's perspective, all features are equal. There are no sacred cows, because they're capitalist. Any feature, may be arbitrarily raised or lowered in priority at any time according to the revenue attached and the business benefit that it brings. So, you know, w when you go to a product manager and we say, well, we must have two-factor authentication immediately, this, this is just one example reaction is, you know, none of his customers are going to, none of his customers who are business leaders are going to come to him and say, I love that you have two-factor auth now, 
shut up and take my money, right? That is never going to happen. So from his perspective, it's a low priority feature. Not because it's security, but just because it, it's just one of hundreds of low priority features that have no incremental revenue attached. All right, so here's another paraphrase. And this is, um, this is a paraphrase from a, uh, a software. This is actually more of a, an engineering lead than a product manager, but this is you know, more or less how it looks from the other side of the table. So, and, and in this case, this particular individual had a really good point because this is the case where they were already a third of a way into their project trying to ship a new product. They had already had their resources and their, their head count had already been cut. Their budgets had been cut. Their timetable had been accelerated. They were on a death march already trying to ship this thing on time to satisfy their masters. And then they get all, a bunch of security requirements dropped on them after this process that they had no idea were coming. And so they're basically, and you know, if you think about it, if this weren't security, if somebody did this to us with a non-security feature, well, most of us would probably react the same way. But if you want us to do twice the work with 25% uh, less people and you're increasing my deadlines and you're giving me no new resources, well, how is that fair? Well, you know, it isn't. Most of the time it really isn't fair. So why do we do that? So here's, this is the heart of the dilemma. So there is a convention that safety is free. So when you look at conversations between software manufacturers and software buyers, most software buyers say, I do not pay for safety because safety is free, either because it's an aspect of quality or it's cultural more that safety is free. I do not pay for safety. I do not pay for security. I get that for free. You need to give that to me. Software manufacturers look at it and say, well, you know, you've got 12 or 24 pages of security requirements in, in the contract, and some of those things are big ticket items that are, have millions of dollars in cost attached. And, you know, work isn't free, and software isn't, you know, things are not free. That isn't fair. So, in a way, you know, they, who is right and who is wrong, I'm not here to answer that. Uh, I'm not here to solve this. I'm here to explore the, the problem. So, I want to talk about, you know, my focus here is not so much on what should they be doing. It's more about what is actually happening today. So a social dilemma is, so I had to go back and study game theory. And game theory is really complex. So I had some advisors on this to help me. Um, and I'm no expert by any means. But game, in, in game theory, a social dilemma is where both parties choose to act in rational self-interest. But this creates a bad outcome for all. It's a very interesting paradox. So in this case, it's a social dilemma because both parties choose the selfish option, which is not to pay for, secure, for better software security. And then what we get is we get worse software security, which is a bad outcome for all, which is not the outcome we want, but that's what we get. Um, so it's a situation where individuals think they'll profit from selfishness unless everyone chooses the selfish alternative, in which case the whole group loses and, and they, they get worse outcomes than they want. Too many group members choose to pursue individual profit and immediate satisfaction, which is rational if you're thinking as an individual, but thinking as a member of a, a, a group system, it's actually not rational. So this is something we, so um, in game theory, um, most of us have probably heard of the prisoner's dilemma. It's probably the most cited game theory problem example. Um, I believe that the stag hunt model is actually what we're talking about here. And this is, this is something that is a little bit less known. But in the stag hunt, the stag hunt game means that there are two or more parties to a hunt. So we're, we're out in our hunting clothes and horses and we're hunting you know, with, we've got hounds and we're, we're hunting for things. So if the, if the parties to the hunt cooperate, they get a stag, which a stag is just a, I think it's just another name for a deer, I think, because some of this game theory was stuff was written a long time ago. So if the parties cooperate, they get a stag, which is a lot of food. So we get to eat for like a week, and that's great. Everyone's happy. If the parties don't cooperate, then, then each individual party gets a hare, which a hare is a word for a rabbit. So a rabbit is a little bit of food, so you get maybe like one meal, and then you're hungry the rest of the day. So if you cooperate, you get a lot of food, really good outcome. Game theories are measured in, um, rewards are measured in what's called utils. So if, if you cooperate, everybody gets many utils. If, you d if they don't cooperate, they get one util, which is a small amount of food. 
So in the software world, if we, if we switch from a stag hunt to a security hunt, this is what it looks like. So if the software manufacturers and the software buyers cooperate, we get much, much stronger software security. Now, granted, I'm not going to say we get software security because that's another question. But we get better software security relative to what we have now. And I know that you can do this because I've done this myself. So I know it can be done. It's not easy, but it can be done. Um, if they don't cooperate, then we get relatively weaker security, which is what we have now. So co what does cooperate mean? So cooperate means for the software manufacturer, the product manager decides to increase investment of resources and time for security features, meaning they raise priority of security features. They take them out of the backlog. They put them in a sprint, and they make them first-class features. And you know this means rather than just having a security sprint occasionally here or there, we're talking about many security sprints. We're talking about doing much more engineering on security. For the software, uh, the software buyer, cooperation means invest by paying higher prices. Uh, granted, it doesn't mean like we're not talking about necessarily doubling or tripling the price of software, but there needs to be an incremental. If if we're going to be building, you know, software features that are very expensive, there has to be an incremental increase in prices because this is business. So if both parties cooperate and they invest, we would get much stronger, we, we get relatively stronger software security. If the parties don't cooperate, we get weaker software security, which is what we have today. Make sense? So where do we go then? So this leads directly into the regulation debate, which is the conversation I was having with the, the DHS uh, Minister of Software guy five years ago. So let me preface this by saying, I'm actually not here today to try and sell you a regulation scheme because I don't think there is a winner amongst the regulation ideas that are competing in the marketplace of ideas. There's not a consensus, and I don't think there is a clear winner, but the fact that there isn't, the fact that we don't know what to do about this is really interesting. So I'm gonna propose, I'm gonna explore two options here, one of which is regulation. I'm gonna propose um, a private sector solution that is going to be probably a little bit controversial and may even upset some people, but I just let me just preface this by saying that I'm not advocating we do this, I'm exploring what the options look like. Finally, I do actually have a concrete recommendation to make. So the regulation debate has been going on for at least six years. I remember seeing a panel debate this at RSA 2011, and it, it's been debated for you know maybe closer to a decade, and there are strong proponents on both sides. So what does regulation mean? So regulation itself can mean a lot of things. It can mean government regulation of, of software security quality. Uh, it could mean a market-based approach that isn't, is not a, a private sector approach, which has significant problems of its own. And then finally, um, the faith-based solution. Anybody, this, this, this is a term where, I don't know if anybody remembers, but during the, uh, the Bush administrations, both Bush Jr. and Sr., sometimes you hear people talk about, well, we need faith-based solutions as an approach to, as an alternative to more government. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually explore what that looks like as well. So <clears throat> what does regulation mean? So one definition of regulation is, um, if you talk to, there are a number of parties to this, if you talk to them and say, yes, we need regulation, we need to regulate software security research and make it stop. And we need to do that immediately. So that's one point of view. Um, that obviously just hides the problem. It's not a solution. And then there's another camp that says, well, we need to regulate the supply of software security bugs but through economic incentives, either through law and standards and bureaucracy, or possibly through a private sector solution, which I'll show you what the heck that looks like. So, you know, this is kind of, we kind of get stuck in this mode today. We have, we have people saying, yes, yes, we need regulation, as in, you know, make it stop. Just make, make everybody stop publishing bugs and breaking all the things, because if you would just stop publishing the bugs, then I you know, could quiet the noise and I could get back to building the products that I want to build that I can sell. And, you know, so th this is a very short-sighted kind of non-solution, but we do kind of tend to get stuck here. And, you know, there's been... Over the years, of course, there's been enormous discourse on this issue on Twitter. Obviously, most security researchers uh, argue that, that criminalizing security regulation or, or illegalizing it is, is you know, not the answer. Um, but this, this conversation, you know, the fact that this conversation is still going on just proves that we are still very much learning about the problem. 
Um, some people, this is, an, this is one actually EULA. This is a EULA from a commercial software product that um, is thought to discourage security research. I've heard num a number of researchers tell me that they don't do research in this product because of this EULA and because the legal department is so aggressive. And then the end result is what we see is that a lot of the research, and I'm not going to name this product because I haven't been provided a lawyer for this talk, but um, it's also not important what product this is. You know, the point is that what happens here is that a lot of the security research on this product comes from places like Russia, which, you know, if you ever tried to do, if you ever tried to work with law enforcement or sue somebody in Russia, you find out that, you know, Russian legal authorities can't cooperate with themselves, never mind anybody else, right? So you are not going to sue security researchers in Russia and, and get anywhere. So, you know, moving it to nation, you know, moving it into the gray market areas is obviously probably not a better outcome for us. Um, there have been things like the Wassenaar Agreement, changes to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Most of this, I think, is made by, I think the real problem here is that the, the lawmakers who are working on this stuff really need a lot more help from the technology community in understanding these issues, framing the debate, and trying to figure out a workable approach, and that's on us. I think we need to help them. So if you look at pro-regulation arguments, um, I don't know if anybody went to RSA 2011, but there was a heated debate there on a panel. And Bruce Schneier said that, yes, we need to regulate software because what we have today is like consumers testing their own food, uh, right, which doesn't make any sense. This is like the food industry in, uh, you know, 19, you know, a century ago in the food industry, they had serious safety problems and people would actually die from eating food on a regular basis. And th that was another social dilemma. So um, uh, opponents will say, yes, there is a problem, but regulation is, has too many, uh, too many unsolved issues to be sorted out. And in fairness, there are some. So um, proponents will also point to the fact that other, reg other industries have had social dilemmas around safety, that none of which could be solved from within. They all required external regulation by government or by the state, and software is no different. Um, they will argue that this is only, only external economic forces can affect this. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. I don't know if anybody saw this from, this was Black Cat uh, two years ago, I think. And you know, software has never been subject to liability for various reasons that are too dense to go into here. And so obviously there, there is no liability attached to software and there's no liability attached to software security. So the counter arguments, the major argument here is that nobody knows how to regulate software security. Like how do we actually do that? Well, the truth is nobody really knows. Um, so the counter argument from the, from the software lobby is well, you know, first of all, we already self-regulate and that's working fine. But if you could regulate researchers, as in make them stop, that'd be great. We'd like you to do that, right? Then the next argument is, well, there is no actionable plan here. They would argue that we don't have, the, the software library would say, we don't have the manufacturing science to make perfectly reliable software. We don't even know how to do that, much less make software that is demonstrably secure. And demonstrably secure to what standard? Because we don't know how to make software that is secure, period. Um, and then if you push them far enough, you'll, hear, you'll start hearing about what's sometimes called the nuclear option. And what that means is, um, if you really push for this, you'll start to hear things like, well, if you're going to regulate software, we're going offshore, we're not coming back. And so, you know, all those high paying tech jobs in your district, Senator, you can say goodbye to and good luck. So, you know, obviously nobody wants to talk. Now, is this a real threat or an empty threat? Well, nobody really knows, but nobody wants to find out. So. The, other, the reason that there's no way forward here is because, by the way, this is used by permission from a really great OWASP training class called Practical Web Application Pen Testing by Tim Tomes, and I'm going to uh, include a link to him in the acknowledgments that I'll put in a blog post for you. Uh, but basically, this is, this is the short answer of why can't we, why isn't there a way forward? Well, because static and dynamic analysis tools are great at finding bugs and they're useful, but a lot of the really serious security flaws that we find still come out of manual testing. This is slow, it's expensive, it requires very specialized knowledge. There are only a few thousand people in the world that are really good at this, probably less than 10,000. So this is slow and it's hard to scale. So we get into this problem. It's like, okay, well let's declare software security regulation, okay. And so then what? Like what is that, what, do, what standard do we engineer to? You know, first of all, 
you know, the first problem is, is nobody can agree on what the standard should be for software security or, you know, can we attach liability to that? There's no consensus on this and there's, there's, there's no consensus in sight. So um, this is a very snarky comment I made when on Twitter when, you know, this is another, con that software security debate has been taking place on Twitter for a long time. You know, I made this comment is, you know, if we do declare software security, if we, you know, if, if we just declare, yes, you shall make your software secure or else, and we put some agency in charge of that, then probably, probably what happens is that nobody then knows whether they can ship anything or not, and so now we're perfectly secure because there is no software, right? So then the, the other counter-regulation is, the, 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 the first counter-argument you get is that self-regulation is working, and you know, I think we can agree that given the kinds of security disasters that we see, it's pretty clear that self-regulation is it, it may be doing some good, but it's not going to move the metrics and it's not gonna solve the problem any more than self-regulation could solve social dilemmas around safety in other industries. Um, so software manufacturers will argue though that self-regulation is effective, it's optimal, and it's working. And they'll point to things like, well, we have processes, we have you know, dashboards, product managers, we, have, you know, we do a pen test once a year, and then we, you know, put that in a backlog. Um, there's an increasing trend towards bug bounties, and I think bug bounties are very promising in, in terms of making pen testing and security research more accessible to lots more organizations. But, you know, again, with bug bounties, most of the time we're testing things after they've been released and they've been shipped. And so, it, you know, if you're finding lots of security flaws after a product's been shipped, those may or may not get fixed. You're also not gonna find things like design flaws, typically, in, in a bug bounty, you're probably not going to find design flaws or logic errors or other serious issues that would not typically be found by a, t a pen tester coming in on a black box model. So they're, those are really useful, but I don't think that those are going to save us. So the pro regulars will say, yes, you know, your bug bounties and your process is good, but this is only as sophisticated as your customer scrutiny demands and the software buyers lack the sophistication to really measure software product quality. Because one, they don't have access to your product source trees and your, your backlogs and threat models, and they simply don't have what they need to do a meaningful assessment, they can't. And two, the customers, you know, the software buyers that are going and, and buying a two-week pen test and pointing that at you, that is informative, but a two-week pen test looking for things like SQLi and XSS is not really, uh, it doesn't really go deep enough to make a, a real judgment about software security quality, so. And of course, the nuclear option exists that if you regulate software, the entire software industry is going offshore and the, the software industry will kind of get together and they'll buy the, an island and they'll call it software land and they'll move everything there. And this is probably an empty threat because these software, you know, the software manufacturers are not going to abandon the major markets that we're talking about regulation. So this is probably an empty threat, but nobody wants to find out. Obviously, we don't want to go there. So let's talk about a private sector solution. So what would it look like? What would an alternative to government regulation look like? Well, I don't know if people realize, how many people realize this, but there actually are exploit exchanges operating today and have been for years. And these are kind of unofficial, semi-secretive exchanges where exploits are bought and sold by exploit brokers. Now we can't see any of that today because it's all very, uh, it's very invisible to us. But if you, t um, I actually interviewed the CEO of an exploit brokerage and, and looked at this in the course of developing this talk. And if you do that, it gets really interesting because there's a lot of data in there that we could make a lot of derivations from if we could see it, but we can't. So, so first off, the first question though is, can we make derivations about product security quality from equity trading data we already have, like stock price. Well, let's look at that. So here is a company, this is one of the most prolific software manufacturers, charted over approximately 20 years. Um, this, is, this is stock price, this is volume, and these are, these are the weird um, metrics that the analysts on CNBC talk about. So I went down this road because I, uh, I started learning about finance and this stuff about four years ago, and it's how I got into these ideas. So anybody want to guess who this is? Here's, here we are, this is 1994. Uh, I made this chart a while back, so it ends uh, more than a year ago, but it's, it is Microsoft. So, you know, 
if you look at this, Microsoft kind of invented what we call the security development life cycle somewhere in here. And then they went sideways for a while. So if you're, a, if you're a, a, an MBA from Harvard or Wharton or someplace and you're looking at that and saying, well, where's the security lift? Where's the security bounce? It's really unclear where it is. Um, here's another one, another prolific software and hardware manufacturer, one of the most prolific in history, charted again over approximately 20 years. Anybody, anybody recognize this? This is Apple. And Apple, you know, it, it, people argue about whether Apple has an STL. I mean, they clearly they have a significant security engineering process, um, but you know they haven't they haven't been as S, you know doing as many SDL like things and SDL evangelism as say Microsoft. Um, but but I mean, look at them. You know, without an they don't have an SDL, and look they've gone to the moon. So you know, where's this? Where's the the security you know downside there? Um, in fairness, Apple actually has a really good security practice, as we'll see in a moment. Um, this is another software manufacturer that had a serious data breach about four years ago, um, right about here. Anybody, anybody recognize this? <coughs> this is a public record breach, obviously, that we've all heard of. Um, no, it's not Target. It's actually a software, it's, a software, uh, it's actually a, a security product manufacturer. It's RSA. So RSA had their breach here, and they definitely, it definitely had an effect. It, it you know, cut them by a third, um, but they've since recovered. And in fact, they've, in fact, they've since recovered and gone on to all-time highs. So in the, in the exploit exchanges, let's power through this. So we know that there are very, very large scale buying and selling of exploits going on in, in the, in the secret markets. And so this is actually pricing data from a few years ago that the CEO of an, explo an exploit brokerage provided to the media. And it's interesting, you can see there's a wide range of pricing starting at about 5K and ranging up to a quarter million. And what's interesting about this is, is this sort of meshes with my expectations as somebody who's been in the trenches for a long time in terms of where do we see more or fewer exploits relatively. You know, Microsoft is, is, is gotten, has become a much harder target over the course of the decade. Some of these other um, things are still relatively, exploits are relatively expensive, and then things like iOS is, has consistently been a very hard target. And if we look at, this is more recent data, um, where we see there's a range here, now the price range is higher. We're ranging between 10,000 and 1.5 million. The street price for a, a remote root exploit for Apple iOS is well into the millions now, which is amazing. And so when I look at this, um, I see th it, it, we can sort of derive that there are supply and demand zones here. So what if we allowed, now again, this is a controversial idea and I'm not proposing we do this, but I, this is what I, I want to explore what a private sector solution would look like. What if we opened up these, you know, what if we closed the dark markets and we moved them into the public domain and said, trade exploits on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, like commodities? Well, commodities are all public data. It's where we can see price, we can see volume, and we can see dozens of other metrics, which a few of us understand, but they talk about on CNBC all day. So looking at that, if we look at things like price and volume for software exploits, then the analyst could make simple derivations about product security quality. Because if you're in a demand zone and an exploit costs millions, you're probably doing a relatively better job on security than something where an exploit costs five or 10,000 and they're in a supply zone. Now there are, there are some problems with that to work out. Um, for example, the first problem is if you asked a product manager if there's any idea they hate more than software security regulation, they'd say no, um, with the possible exception of this. If you asked them, would you mind if we trade your, your software vulnerability exploits on the commodities exchange, then you'd probably get this face. So this is not, you know, this is pretty much a non-starter, but an interesting idea. So first off, we probably can make derivation problem. We, we can make derivations about software security quality. Um, there is the problem that Exploits are intangible goods. You know, there really isn't a way to to stop, you know, you from from it's to stop me from copying my exploit and giving it to all of you for free. 
that's a hard problem. Things like you know, intangible commodities like futures, those are also intangible, but those exist in a server, in a ledger, in a server, in a brokerage somewhere. And so I can't just copy that you know, and give it to all of you because it, it, you know, the state exists in a place that's controlled, unlike software. There's also the problem that demand for a particular exploit may briefly spike astronomically if the military says, well, I need to get that, I need to pop that computer right now. You know, I don't, and I don't care what it costs, give me an exploit for this. Then demand may, there may be uh, transient spikes in demand. We can solve this with something called open interest because the commodities exchange publish open interest, which is the number of contracts outstanding. So if we see that there's a huge spike in price, but there's, a, there's no increase in open interest or you know, open interest increased by one or two, then we can assume that it's an artificial spike. The other problem is intangibility. Now, how do we stop people from copying exploits and giving them away? There's also the problem that we're selling exploits, which, you know, as, as we can agree from the news today, where we have zero-day exploits, we have very serious zero-day exploits in circulation right now, which are being used to do great harm across the world. You know, selling exploits publicly is, is a problem. Um, the bigger problem is that the major customers for the exploit brokerages are governments. They're governments and sovereign militaries. And they are not interested in a public exploit exchange. They're interested in a private one where these things remain secret because when they become public, their value tends to evaporate. So even if, we, even if Congress declared a, that exploits will now be sold on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the feedback I've been given is that the governments, the militaries would ignore that and they would still buy these things in the underground or the, the private exchanges. And even if Congress outlaws that, they'll still do it because then they can go and get what's called an, an OUI, which is an, an OUI stands for, uh, actually stands for, I don't know what it stands for, but an OUI is basically like a permission slip to go and do something illegal um, that you need to do for reasons of national security. So that's what I've been told. Now the other problem is, who are, so if, if the governments aren't participating in the, in the brokerage, then who are the customers? Yes. All right, so we have to wrap up. The problem here is that it, you know, governments are sort of legitimate customers for weapons and things like, well, we can debate whether, they are, whether that is legitimate or not. But the state has jurisdiction on the use of force, so they kind of have the right to buy and use weapons. But if the governments aren't the customers here, then who are the customers? And what legitimate use do they have to be buying exploits? So we probably have unacceptable moral hazard here, which is completely unworkable. So finally, I'll leave you with this. Um, if we decide that we need a faith-based solution, I would argue that the faith-based solution is what we have today. That we don't apply policy or economic forces in a way that drives change. Instead, we, we evangelize security because we believe in security. And we have people called evangelists whose job is to evangelize security and try to, try to have you know, security revivals and, and persuade the business to believe in security and take it more seriously. And you know, if we decide now, granted, this is this is I'm getting myself in more trouble here because this is probably a controversial thing to say, but I think the question is valid: is are we practicing a religious approach to an economic problem? If we are, that's not rational. Um, that's not rational, and that's not going to help. And so we need to think about that. Um, the proposal I'll leave you with is that this is a quote from Justice Brandeis. Um, what I'll say in it quickly is that. All of these approaches we're talking about are designed to try to surface this information into the hands of software consumers and software buyers to make more informed decisions. But they're all very convoluted, indirect ways of doing that. Why don't we just surface this information? Why don't we say, OK, software manufacturers, you need to publish your security backlogs and tell us what you know and what's sitting in your backlogs for products that you're shipping. That, all is, that is now public. And then software consumers can read, analysts can write about this and who's doing a better, worse job on security. And then consumers can vote with their feet. And that would be something that's relatively simple and implementable. So I will follow up with a blog post with these acknowledgments. But that is my talk. <laughs>